Hi, welcome everybody. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. It's noon. So for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Jim Marchiori. I'm uh, executive director of the Global Energy Management Program here in the Business School. And uh, we're very happy to, uh, to host you all today. And I'm going to introduce our speaker here, Tyler Rowert, in just a second. Uh, a couple of announcements I want to make first. Um, first of all, we're webcasting this, so please uh, put your phones on vibrate or whatever so we don't get too much uh, interference in the webcast. Restrooms are around back there if you should need them. We still have a lot of lunch for anybody who wants lunch. Um, I don't know if everybody's met the whole GEM team who's here yet, but we have Sarah Dudowski here running around. Uh, Nate Holt, uh, Michelle Motley is back there. Noni Wainwright is running the thing, and we got Alexis uh, Italot back there, our graduate assistant. So if you need anything from any of us, just let us know. Um, some announcements. Uh, we just started our January student cohort last weekend. Uh, next one is in July. So if you're interested, um, we already have, uh, just tell me, a number of applications for July, which we haven't seen before this early in the uh, admissions process. So it's a rolling process. So get your application in soon. There's a prospective student webcast scheduled on February 23rd at noon, if you want to learn more uh, from that. We also have an open house uh, and a networking event on Thursday, April 20th from 5 to 7. Um, and then with the speaker series, we're really trying to work hard to get our webcast uh, attendance up because it's free and you can be sitting at your desk. So if you have anybody that you know who's interested in, in, in events like this and you can't necessarily make it down here, so I'm going to go ahead and tune in because there's, there's no reason not to. And then one last announcement before I get to Tyler. Um, uh, Martin Volker in the back of the room from the uh, Colorado Renewable Energy Society gave us this. And I think uh, some of you may have also seen these. Um, the grid uh, needs a battery. So it's a battery and clean energy um, uh, uh, panel on Thursday, January 26th in Jefferson County. So you might want to look out for that as well. So. Um, then moving on, uh, I want to welcome Tyler, Tyler Rauer. Tyler is an international corporate attorney with Messner Reeves. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I just had an opportunity to meet Tyler, I don't know what, maybe two months ago, I'd say it was. Uh, Irene, my wife, and I started going to this series of breakfasts that the World Traders Trade Center put on an international trade that Tyler was running along with Den uh, Denise Froning from um, Washington. And it was such a good series that, you know, we reached out and started to get to know each other, and now I'm gone. I've gone on to Tyler's uh, committee of international trade interest through the World Trade Center, and we're starting to forge a lot of links there. So I'm really happy to be able to to have him talk with us today. His practices um, focuses on. I'm going to read some of this: energy, energy formation and funding, cross-border investment, international business transactions, international arbitration. Um, but he's really focused on international trade. He's a real leader in international trade topics here in Denver. He's on the board of directors of Sister Cities International, which is an organization we're starting to work with more and more because we have a number of interesting sister cities of Denver that have some really interesting energy things going on that we think we can interact with. Um, first and foremost right now among those is Chennai, India, and Jason Nagy here in the audience is helping us with some of that stuff. Um, Tyler is also co-chair of the International Transactions Section of the Colorado Bar Association's Business Law Group, and he's director of the World Trade Center Denver. But what makes it interesting for today's topic is before he came to Denver, Tyler spent several years in Washington doing um, international security work in, in the national security community. And I know we've had a couple of discussions around energy security, and so it's very interesting in that regard. And his topic today is on transatlantic energy security, which, you know, with the new administration coming in, those, both of those terms, uh, you know, the transatlantic side, there's a lot of uncertainty. And then when we start thinking about transatlantic in Europe, because of Russia policy and Russia being such a major supplier of energy to Europe, there's a lot of uncertainty there. So I think it's a really timely, really good topic. And uh, without further ado, Tyler. Thanks so much, Jim. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm in your seats. I always course like to listen to the introduction who I'm speaking to but really I'm thinking why should I listen to this guy you know what's, what's he have to talk the reason to listen to me here now is not because I'm an energy expert uh, I'm not the the expertise in global energy in the global room 
my expertise is in international trade law and policy. And having had a decade working in the US security community in parts of the world where energy played a role in, a fairly strong role in security decisions, uh, I think that makes me fairly well placed to talk to you today about Russia, European uh, energy security and the role that the United States plays in that. Um, I think one of the things that makes this interesting to us today uh, is the changing nature of the relationship between the United States and Russia, which will change tomorrow, literally tomorrow, our relationship with Russia changes. Uh, so does America's trade policy. It changes tomorrow. So we stand here today at an interesting place, looking backwards at how the United States and Europe have worked together on all sorts of issues, but we'll focus on, on uh, the energy trade here today. Um, but that relationship will be different tomorrow than it is today. And the US's relationships with businesses all around the world will be different tomorrow than it is today. Regardless of what anybody's politics are, that change happens tomorrow. So let's, uh, let's explore that a little bit. Now, I wanna set some expectations. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how our relationship with Europe is gonna change. I don't know how our relationship with Russia is gonna change. I don't know how anything is going to change, but I do have some ideas about some questions that we should be asking ourselves and some things that we might wanna be thinking about in the global energy space. So let's start by breaking this topic down, right? Um, the focus today is on transatlantic energy security and more specifically role that, that Russia plays in that and the, the changing nature of the role, the relationship between the United States and Russia and what that means for transatlantic energy. So let's talk about the transatlantic relationship broadly, both with a perspective on the past and sort of looking forward what energy security really is about and the Russian role in both of those things. Okay, so the transatlantic relationship, we're talking mostly about North America and Europe, particularly Western Europe, but since the end of the Cold War, we've, we've crept farther and farther east. Uh, the European Union is now much bigger than it was uh, some time ago. I would also include Mexico in that transatlantic relationship. Mexico, I think, is a, a major part of the North American uh, trading area. Mexico is a major energy player. Mexico matters a great deal in this relationship. It's often excluded, but I think that's to the detriment of a full analysis. So when we're talking here today, I'm including Mexico, along with the United States and Canada, on the western side of the Atlantic, the North Atlantic. And then let's really just focus in on NATO and the European Union on the European side. So the EU is fairly easy to understand, right? Common market, uh, common movement. NATO is a little bit different. Military and security alliance. Um, President-elect Trump has questioned the relevance of NATO. Um, I was working in the Pentagon for a decade. Every day we questioned the relevance of NATO in that building, but never publicly in this way. Uh, and never for the, for the reasons that, that are being discussed now. So there can be differences among allies. That happens a lot. And we worked very hard to move NATO away from a Cold War framework into the 21st century and how it can be uh, a useful institution now, a security institution in Europe. Um, that's coming under question now. So is the strength of the European Union and the, the unity of, of that political block. Uh, Brexit matters. So does a lot of the financial crisis is sort of hitting in Italy and, and places like that. This matters for our transatlantic energy relationship. Energy security. You all know what it means, but it's useful to get that out on the table so that we're all clear what we're talking about. We're really talking about ample and stable supply 
and reasonable and stable prices. Notice stability happens in, in both of those places. So supply, prices, um, typically when we think about energy security writ large, the general bias is that the more large democracies there are that are producers of energy, that are suppliers of energy, the better off the, the world's energy supply is and the more energy secure we all are. Um, North America is in a relatively stable position from an energy security standpoint. A lot of fossil fuels here between Canada, the United States and Mexico. Um, renewables are an increasing proportion of that energy mix. Full disclosure, I represent a number of European renewable energy companies in the United States. I also represent American fossil fuel firms that do work in, let's say, difficult countries overseas. So I've got my hands in the energy industry in, in multiple places. But the work in the US is mostly with foreign firms coming here in the renewable space and that's substantially. Then we've got the European Union on the other side of the, the energy security front. So the EU imports, what my stats here say, more than half of all the energy it consumes. Dependency is particularly high for crude oil at more than 90% natural gas around 66%. This is coming from the European Union itself or the European Commission. Um, a lot of those countries in the EU are heavily dependent on one supplier, Russia. Um, they're vulnerable to supply disruption. That might be because of political disputes, commercial disputes, infrastructure failures, all kinds of reasons that supply might be disrupted. Uh, Y'all might remember in 2009, I think it was, uh, there was a dispute between Russia and the Ukraine and Russia sort of cut off supplies, gas supplies to the Ukraine, made a lot of people in Europe very cold that winter. Um, the Russian annexation of the Crimea, it's happening in the eastern part of, of the Ukraine now, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia as a result of that have also made many Europeans nervous about the stability of their supply especially in natural gas from Russia. Okay, so they've responded to this. What does that response look like? Well, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about the United States being the savior of Europe, that liquefied natural gas exports from the US were gonna rescue the European Union from its dependence on Russia. I think we've all seen that that's not the case. It's part of the mix, right? Increased US liquefied natural gas into, well, all of the world, but Europe in particular has an impact. It increases competition, but it certainly hasn't pushed Russia out of its primary place of supplying Europe. And there are some good reasons for that. Um, Russia is close. And I don't know if you know this, but near things are closer than far things. So the proximity matters. Um, Russia also offers Europe some flexibility in when they, they can supply them uh, that LNG exports from the United States just have a hard time matching. Right? So that proximity and flexibility matter a great deal. Um, one of the other things that Europe has done to try to diversify its energy mix is really focus on renewables. I think they said that by 2020, they wanted to target 20% of, of EU energy would be from renewable sources. That's a heady goal. They have moved very far in that direction. Um, and that has actually benefited the US renewable energy industry a great deal. So as the Europeans are growing their market, they're finding that the United States is another place where they can sell their goods. United States suppliers are supplying producers in Europe. Similarly, European producers and suppliers are coming to the United States. So we have a fairly tightly integrated renewable energy industry between the United States and Europe. I work in it every day, moving widgets back and forth from Europe into the United States, the US into Europe, all as part of this sort of network of renewable energy industries. The goods flow both ways. Companies are supplying each other on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so that's the 
situation as it exists today. Tomorrow will be a different day. Uh, tomorrow about this time, I want to say, I think the inauguration should be about now, tomorrow. Um, so I'm not one of these people who thinks that everything is going to change overnight. It's not. States have interests that matters. Does everybody remember at the start of the Obama administration, they wanted to have the reset with Russia? Yeah, how did that go? Not, not so much. Do you remember when George Bush looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes and he saw his soul and he's a good man and we can work with this guy? Yeah, that happened. So every US administration has tried to change the nature of the relationship with Russia. And state interests keep intruding in that relationship. So do I think the Trump administration has sort of signaled that it intends to have a better relationship with Russia? Yes, I do. Uh, do I think they will actually be able to deliver what they want? No, I don't. I think the relationship, reality will butt up against the, the honeymoon period and we'll, we'll have to see how that relationship blossoms, but we'll get, we'll get deeper into that in a moment. As we analyze this relationship though, uh, especially for the Americans in the audience and, and watching, I think we need to take a minute and think about Russia's interests. You don't have to agree with them, you don't have to like them, but we do have to understand them. And from a Russian perspective, and particularly from Vladimir Putin's perspective, uh, he has a primary goal, and that is to return Russia to international prominence. This is the guy who said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the single biggest disaster of the 20th century. Um, he wants to be the president that brings Russia back. Right? And if I were a Russian, I would think that's a good thing. Many folks on this side of it, of the Atlantic, don't feel the same way. Nonetheless, that's one of their goals. Um, in my work with Russians over, over time, before I moved to Denver a few years ago, um, I found their negotiating style to be different than the American style, right? Americans tend to be focused on the process by which we reach agreements and that those agreements matter a great deal. For us, the means of an agreement matter as much as the end of that agreement, the goal. For my Russian friends, I found that it was slightly different, that often the ends would justify any means to get to that end. So transactions are fine and deals will work so long as they advance you toward your end. And if conditions change and that agreement that you have reached previously is no longer advantageous to you, then you change the terms of the agreement. Um, that's something that we've seen a lot over time and Americans need to be aware that this is something that often happens when we're working with our friends in Russia. It's also, I think, important for Americans to remember that the Russian economy is heavily dependent on fossil fuels. It's not just about fossil fuels. There's, it, it's a real country with a deep economy and a lot of people who live there. Um, it's maybe not as big as other people, as people may think it is. I think it's roughly about the size of the Swedish economy, if I remember. But again, heavily de dependent on fossil fuels. Um, I think we've also seen that as part of the goal to return Russia to prominence and to deal with its dependence on fossil fuels, secure the, the markets for those fuels, we have seen, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, some support for nationalist movements in, throughout Europe and in the United States um, to try to break down Western alliances and cohesion. That seems to be the purpose. We have seen what looks to be meddling in the United States election. Whether or not it influenced the election isn't relevant. The fact of the matter is that there's a, an effort to influence politics here. That matters. We can start to see how what Russian interests are by the actions that they're performing. And it seems to me that one of those interests is to break apart the Western alliance, whether it's NATO, the European Union, because that Western alliance means that the West is stronger in its negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And if you can split countries off one by one, 
you weaken their ability to stand together as a collective whole. And therefore you strengthen Russia's negotiating position relative to Europeans or, or Americans. All right. Then we turn to the United States and what the new administration sort of looks like. Caveat, this is all really a mystery at this point. I don't think we can be very confident in what a, a Trump administration will actually do, but we can start to think about what some of the signals mean. Um, first, on the transatlantic relationship, um, there have been some very significant questions about NATO the NATO alliance and our alliance with European Union, with European unity, support for Brexit from the president elect himself. Uh, those sorts of issues tell us that maybe this administration, or at least this president, won't be as committed to the transatlantic alliance as past presidents have been. That said, there are others in the administration who appear to be very committed to that relationship. I'm thinking of Jim Mattis, I'm thinking of Joe Dunford, uh, some of these folks who have signaled disagreement with their boss on what the U.S. relationship with Russia should be with relation to that transatlantic alliance. Um, then we can move into the energy space. I think what we're seeing is an emphasis on fossil fuels, sort of a relaxation on an emphasis on renewable energy, although there is an emphasis on manufacturing jobs in this administration. And the renewable energy industry is a manufacturing industry where there are a lot of manufacturing jobs. So we see sort of two arms of, of this new administration's policy coming into conflict with one another. We're gonna to try to reduce the influence of renewable energy, of the renewable industry, and we're also reducing US manufacturing jobs. So I don't know how that is gonna play out. Um, I think we've also seen a skepticism about climate change. Um, again, what that means in the fossil fuel versus renewables debate, I don't think anybody can predict at this point. If the folks who favor increased manufacturing went out, I think renewables may very well see continued support, subsidies, those sorts of things. If the fossil fuel folks win that argument within the White House, it go the other way and we just don't know how that's going to turn out yet um trade um it matters a great deal to transatlantic energy security obviously we're trading fossil fuels renewable supplies all kinds of things across the atlantic um i think what we're likely to see in the new administration is an emphasis on exports that's fairly clear so liquefied natural gas exports would be included. Energy exports are a piece of that. So I think we'll see an increased uh, emphasis on those energy exports and exports of all kinds. So the renewable energy industry may very well benefit from this emphasis on exports as well. At the same time, we see a hostility to imports, right? We see the the, at least the administration in waiting sort of targeting particularly Mexico and China. Um, the president started his campaign with an attack on Mexico and I, it's sort of been relentless throughout. Now that might change while in office, but I think you know, one of the best predictors of future behavior is past behavior. So I think we can expect to see a continuation of uh, focus on Mexico and an attempt to increase tariffs on products coming into Mexico. And that matters, I'll get into that a little bit more about why that's important to us in this discussion. Um, at the same time, we've also seen targeting the United Kingdom and Japan positively on the trade. Um, we've also seen some talk from the Republican House, especially about border ta this border tax adjustment idea where we're essentially, this is more complicated than what I'm gonna give you now, but it's essentially a tax on imports and a subsidy to exports. Uh, and there's all kinds of currency implications to that and corporate tax reform implications to that. We don't have to get into it, um, but that may be part of our, our trading relationship as well. Um, we've heard talk about renegotiating NAFTA. I'm not 
quite sure what that means. Um, the Obama administration tried to frame its renegotiation of NAFTA as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That we took NAFTA, we extended it, we renegotiated it. The incoming administration doesn't seem to be enamored of that agreement. So we'll see what happens to it. If it can be changed enough to be viewed as uh, being against China and can be changed enough to for this administration to take credit for it, well then maybe we see the, what is today the Trans-Pacific Partnership in some slightly different form adopted by this administration, but we just don't, we just don't know about that yet. Um, the incoming administration, as far as I can tell, hasn't had much to say about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership that's under negotiation now. Um, I am actually not very optimistic about that agreement's um, prospects, not from the US side, but from the European side. Um, I think there are many in Europe who are opposed to the agreement. It's running up against some, some politics in Europe that, that it might find a hard time getting over. So those are our two, the two major players here, right? US and Russia, really. And there's a lot going on in Europe too. This is coming up on election season. A lot is gonna change. But how might this US-Russia relationship change? Energy security across the Atlantic. Well, within the US, we've got the president-elect who's pretty clear on what his views are regarding Russia and how he wants that relationship to be better. We have his national security advisor, General Flynn, who has a similar view of Russia. He wants a better relationship with him. I think that's mostly tied to what he sees as an alliance uh, to fight radical political Islam, especially of the Sunni variety. General Flynn tends to be very focused on terrorism. Uh, Vladimir Putin talks a lot about confronting uh, Islamist extremism. I think they've got uh, a place there where they can agree. Um, may only be a tactical alliance. We'll see what happens with that. But I think that might be where General Flynn's affinity for Russia comes from. We'll just have to see. Then we've got Rex Tillerson at the State Department. So as CEO of ExxonMobil, worked a lot with Russia. Um, General Mattis at the Department of Defense, General Dunford as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, seem to have a different view of the US-Russian relationship, mostly from a security perspective. Um, then we've got Rick Perry at Energy. Who knows? I don't, I don't know what this means. Um, then on the trade policy front, we have at least four people in the new administration who think they control US trade policy. We've got Wilbur Ross over at Commerce, Lighthizer is the US trade representative and a couple of folks in the White House who all think that they are the point person on US trade policy. I have been involved in turf battles in Washington in the past. They're ugly, they're conducted behind the scenes. You will never see them. We won't know who wins this turf battle for a little while, but eventually there will be signs. Um, but we just don't know what US trade policy is really gonna look like as these for kind of fight it out internally inside, inside of Washington. All right, so what do we think might happen? And this is where I would be interested in your thoughts during our, our Q&A bit. I think one of the most likely things that we see is a, an emphasis on increasing US energy exports. Like that, that seems like an easy win from both the energy policy and the export driven pieces of the agendas, uh, of the administration's agenda. We are I think exceedingly likely to see increased US energy exports. Now, the question then becomes, where are we gonna see them exported to? Are they gonna go to Asia? Maybe, are they gonna go to Europe? If they go to Europe, that increases Europe's energy security. That is helpful to them. It increases competition, perhaps drives down prices. Certainly allows them to renegotiate some, some of their agreements with Russia. So net effect, probably positive for Europe with the US increasing exports to that market. That said, I don't know how the US-Russia relationship is gonna shake out and whether Russia pushes the United States to export, but export to Asia, don't export to Europe. Europe is our backyard. Europe is our sphere of influence. You guys go ahead and export, but don't do it here. I don't know what that, relationship is going to look like how it shakes out but that'll be a signal i think 
uh, a commercial signal about where uh, the relationship is going. I do think that uh, the administration will likely target Mexico and imports from Mexico somehow. Um, to put the legalities aside as a practical matter, an administration has all kinds of tools at its disposal to raise tariffs without congressional approval. This administration is likely to do it. Even if they later, if there's a dispute and they later turn out to be invalid and violate WTO rules or NAFTA rules, it's gonna take years to litigate through that process. So I think it's very likely that we'll see at least threatened tariff increases about uh, goods coming in from Mexico probably actual tariff increases. That's bad for the American renewable energy industry because Mexico has a free trade agreement with Europe, with the European Union. So if I am a European Union renewable energy supplier, I can import my products to Mexico, change them into a different, manufacture them, put them together in a different way, and then import them into the United States duty free. So I can go duty free from Europe to, the, to Mexico and then duty free from Mexico into the United States. That makes my product cheaper, more competitive in the market. If all of a sudden there are duties from Mexico into the United States, then you're less competitive. It's also hard for European manufacturers to import directly into the United States again, because we don't have a free trade agreement with Europe yet, hopefully. Um, those goods come in with a tariff attached to them. So it makes imported renewable energy products and supplies relatively more expensive. Uh, because so many American renewable energy producers are actually European and they have m big chunks of their supply chain are European, it increases the cost of renewable energy in the United States, which I think would be if I were in the fossil fuel industry, I would be in favor of it. But since many of my clients are in the renewable energy industry, I would see something like that happen, right? Uh, so that, I think, is, is going to matter a great deal. So that even though we wouldn't think necessarily that a U.S. administration imposing tariffs on goods coming into the United States from Mexico would impact transatlantic energy security, I think it has a very substantial impact because of the way the supply chains are, con are constructed right now. Um, so that is, is going to matter a, a great deal. Um, and so that is transatlantic energy security coming the other way from Europe into the United States. Um, we will probably also see the death of the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, but we may see the birth of a US-UK free trade agreement. And that will likely be conducted with the US in a position of strength and the United Kingdom in a position of weakness. Uh, with Brexit getting harder and harder every day and, and Theresa May's speech yesterday and the response from the, the EU, it looks like that relationship is getting more and more contentious. Uh, the Brits they, therefore have an interest in negotiating a trade agreement with the United States I, however, would not want to negotiate any deal with Donald Trump from a position of weakness. So if I were British, I would be worried about that trade agreement. Now, even though they need it politically, it might not be the best uh, commercial terms from them, but we won't know that until we see what the agreement, if any, actually looks like. Then we've got some other sort of geopolitical issues that matter in the US, Russia, European triad relationship, Syria, Iran, um, again, Brexit, those things. We can talk about those if you want to in a little bit. But I'd like to close up and then uh, get some questions and comments from, from you all. I think what's clear is that we have a new relationship. And new relationships, while they can be exciting, are uncertain, right? And uncertainty generally is bad for business. Um, I think the uncertainty is particularly dangerous for the renewable energy industry in the US and in Europe. Uh, fossil fuel industry, I think, is probably gonna be in the US. Um, we're gonna likely see more exports 
maybe to to Europe, but certainly to Asia, I think, from the US energy industry. And I think the these interlinked renewable energy industries, it really could go either way, depending on how the relationship with Russia works out, works out, um, but really driven more by the administration's trade policy, not so much its energy policy or even its relationship with Russia. I, I think trade policy is going to be the driver on how the transatlantic energy security relationship exists in that renewable energy slice. Uh, and that I think the linchpin there is going to be our relationship with Mexico, um, which most folks aren't thinking about. So it might be worth a, a discussion in here, uh, but that's how I see the world moving forward. I could be completely wrong. Uh, in fact, I expect to be wrong about a lot of it because we just don't know. But thank you for listening to me jabber for a little while. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much. Yeah. No, it's not that I think little of it. I think it's important. I think this administration is skeptical of climate change. Uh, we're unlikely to see the Paris Accord implemented, for, at least from the United States perspective. And if that's true, then it falls apart globally. So I think a lot about it. I think it's a wonderful thing. There's a reason I work in the renewable energy industry. I just don't think it's in a good place now. Okay. <laughs> Sir. So, so you talk about how the United States uh, has, has not really been the savior to EU with LNG exports. I'm wondering if you look back and uh, see how, say, Trinidad and Tobago, or uh, maybe the northern part of South America, Egypt, over the last 10 or 20 years, have gotten more involved in LNG, and then Israel and, and other countries in uh, Central and South America. What kind of influence did they have? Yeah, I don't know that anybody is going to weaken Russia's position supplying energy to the EU. I, I, I don't think we can think about it in those terms. Russia is big, it is close, it is easy, it just makes commercial sense to have a large chunk of the European Union's, especially gas supply, come from Russia. You can offset it bits and pieces here and there. I worked um, toward the end of my time at DOD, I worked on the Israeli um, LNG facilities. And they share a major field with Cyprus. And depending on how you slice it, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, um, the problem there in getting that gas to market in Europe is Turkey. Uh, Turkey is the major transport hub for most of this stuff. You might not be aware, but Turkey and Greece have a beef over Cyprus. There's Turkish Northern Cyprus, which is only recognized by Turkey. And, uh, but they're in the midst of a peace process now. Um, we'll see how that goes. That might change the relationship. But at this point, Turkey is the bottleneck in getting that LNG in a commercially viable way into Europe. So that's something that's gonna to have to be overcome for Israel to be a, a supplier, a major supplier for Europe. Plus Israel has its own needs that it's gonna to have to supply. Um, Egypt, I worked in the Middle East for a decade. I love Egypt. I would not count on Egypt as a major gas supplier. Libya is a mess. Algeria has some potential there, uh, but these places have been near to Europe for a long, long time and they haven't been able to capitalize on their proximity yet. So I'm cautiously optimistic about their ability to, to enter that market anytime in the, in the near term. So, uh, and then South America, I don't know. I, I have no idea about what their impact might be. Qatar is the world's largest LNG supplier. Qatar has a lot of capacity to be able to, to move markets there. Um, so if Qatar can find a, an efficient way to get its stuff to Europe, well then maybe they can change things, although they have markets in Asia that they are perfectly happy to supply as well. So 
and Iran, after sanctions are lifted, Iran is a major gas supplier as well. And Iranian gas coming through Turkey may be a way to change the equation. But Iran is allied to Russia on a whole host of other issues, most notably on nuclear power. So there, there's that issue as well. So I guess I'm, I don't think anybody in the near term is gonna displace Russia as a major supplier to Europe. Yeah. to facilitate making the LNG reception ability better in, in Europe. Um, I don't see this administration making, this American administration making that a priority because it would cut against Russia's interest. And what I've seen thus far is that this administration is prioritizing Russia over Europe. I could be wrong. And if that equation changes, then maybe we see some movement there um, but at this point, I see in your list of priorities, I see Russia above the EU. Um, so that seems unlikely to me. Now, Europe could do all kinds of things if it wanted to. Um, the European Union could subsidize those. They can, they can make them more commercially viable. Um, the thing about energy security is that business matters, but not as much as politics. Um, if you actually want to ensure energy security, that is a political decision. It is not a commercial decision. And so countries have to be willing to make commercially unreasonable decisions for political purposes. I don't know that there's a political will to do that at this point, but maybe if there's a crisis, that could happen. But at that point, it's too late. Sir. I don't know anything about it, to be honest. Most of my stuff is cross-border. I had some buddies who worked on energy policy in, in DC, happy to put you in touch with them. I wouldn't give you any better answer than Google could give you right now. Yes? So you talked about the relationship with Mexico mm -hmm. in the context of an impact that it made indirectly in Europe. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, that might be part of the Mexico economy that we're going to try to Yeah. Um, so how will the U.S. going to emerge as this huge energy exporter in the next several years? What kind of impact does that have on Mexico's energy resources? I don't know that the U.S. as an exporter matters as much to Mexico's viability as a global energy supplier, as much as Mexico's own ability to modernize its infrastructure and be able to, to make itself an efficient producer. That, I think, matters more than anything that the United States would do, because we're looking at a, a global energy market, right? Like, oil is fungible, money is fungible. Um, in broad strokes, it doesn't matter as much what the United States does, but the effect on Mexico's ability to, to be a profitable energy supplier has less to do with U.S. production than it does with Saudi and Russian production, frankly, and Mexico's own ability to modernize its, its own facilities. Iran sits in that same boat, right? That they have, they've allowed their, their capacity to deteriorate over time. Now they've got to modernize it. I think that matters more than the U.S. So will the U.S. have an impact on Mexico? Yeah. I mean, we're we're going to buy less from Pemex, right? Yeah, that's right. Or as a U.S. company, we're buying. Mm-hmm. 
Oh yeah. So now your costs are like that Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's a that's a good question that I don't know the answer to, except to say that this is yet another example of why picking on Mexico is probably a bad idea. Because if the administration is serious about North American energy independence, it doesn't make any sense to tax energy imported from Mexico, right? If we actually want to be able to tell the Saudis, no, you, got, you guys can do whatever you want. If we want to really be able to cut that relationship loose, which by the way, the dirty little secret is we never would, we don't buy this stuff from Saudi Arabia anyway. Um, Saudi's still going to matter as the marginal global producer, right? Uh, but if we're serious about trying to have North American energy, quote unquote, independence, it doesn't make any sense to pick on Mexico. So point taken. Did you have something? And then we'll move to the back. Uh, if we assume that our new administration plays nice with Russia and we don't push for heavy exports of the EU, Mm -hmm. you know, say redirected across the Pacific. Mm -hmm. How those relationships look, and can we compete with Australian exports of LNG? Right. Can we compete in that space? Pacific. Pacific is tougher than Europe for a lot of reasons. Uh, distance is one. Uh, regulatory environment is another. European Union is one regulatory environment. Asia is all over the place. Right. Um, they're ability to receive shipments is different from place to place. The like I said, the regulations are, uh, are tough. It, wouldn't it be great if we had some kind of a trade agreement where we could work on regulatory harmonization with Asia? Oh, wait, we have that. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we're not going to move that forward. Um, <laughs> so uh, if we're serious, if the energy industry, for instance, is serious about exporting to Asia, then they ought to push the administration on the TPP as well. I, I think that it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, Asia is a harder, it's a heavier lift than Europe. Sir? LNG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain. Well, with respect to energy, yeah. Um, short answer to your question is. Um, it would be easy to start a trade war and it would be difficult to end it, right? They are easy. It's like building a building, right? Like our current trading system has a foundation and there's a superstructure that's built on top of it and it has taken decades to build. Um, but you can knock a building down in an afternoon, right? And then it's difficult to rebuild again. That's my view on what a trade war looks like. Um, so yes, the administration, should it choose, can implement some protectionist measures that as a political matter are likely to trigger a trade war, especially with China, maybe also with Mexico, uh, and maybe others that, that want to get into the mix. I don't think that that is a likely outcome in the short term. I, I do think there are enough people in DC who can whisper in the administration's ear to say, this is bad for all of us. Let's be sensible about it. Let's, you know, let's negotiate our way into a better situation rather than acting unilaterally. But you just never know. I don't think it's likely that the administration will try to violate WTO rules, certainly not on purpose. Um, I think some of their suggestions, their suggested policies, ultimately do violate the WTO, but it's a debatable point that'll have to be litigated. Yes. Okay. She was wondering a little bit about Okay. 
that, do I think Russia will try to do it? My understanding is that the hang up with Southstream is European regulatory issues. And if that's the case, I don't see it moving forward because uh, Europe has an interest in not making itself more dependent on uh, Russian supplies. But I could be wrong there. That, that's a political question um, for an EU, like any, an EU expert might have a different opinion than me, but from my perspective, it seems like it was killed for regulatory reasons the first time. It'll probably die the same death again if they try to do it again. Any others? Sir? Cover, you know, back to the topic that you were discussing uh -huh. about Russia imposing U.S. trade patterns mm. energy exports from Europe being what mechanism do you see that taking? And how can they do that with those questions moving forward? That's all the trade trade secrets. Right. I think the um, this will come top down. This is a you know relationships with a president and with secretary of state that really we're looking at um, how the relationship with Russia gets negotiated over the mid medium term. I think we'll probably start to see, you know, maybe more of the permits for LNG export facilities focused on the West Coast, right? That it's encouraged for, for folks to try to Maybe there are incentives for projects in the Western United States. That might be one of our initial signals. Now, these things take years to, to do, and it takes a lot of money. But that would be one of the first things that I look for, are sort of subtle directing of investment dollars west of the Panama Canal rather than east of the Panama Canal, just from a commercial sense. That, that might be one of our early indicators through the permitting process, through the Department of Energy's permitting process. Uh -huh. um, if you start to see tariffs imposed on Mexico, mm -hmm. what would be your view on how Mexico might respond? I don't know. We have a Mexican election next year. Um, so I think one of the ways Mexico might respond to that is by electing a populist as president. Um, that seems to be in the global trend anyway. Uh, there may very well be some retaliatory tariffs. Mexico has leverage over us the same way that we have leverage over Mexico. Um, my sniff test warning sign to most Americans uh, who are hostile to Mexico is if you are concerned in particular about Mexican immigration to the United States, make sure that Mexico has a strong economy so that those people want to stay in Mexico to earn a living and not come to the United States. So for folks who are worried about immigration, for hostility to Mexico that's focused on immigration, which I think really is the core of, uh, of this whole anti-Mexico rhetoric that we've heard recently, well, the best way to stop immigration from Latin America is to make Mexico prosperous. And you don't do that by imposing tariffs and limiting their ability to employ their people in, in manufacturing facilities there. Uh, but yeah, Mexico could impose retaliatory tariffs on the United States um, in industries where it would hurt us worse. I'm thinking beef, maybe um, a lot of ag products um, or the other industries that go to, to Mexico. I mean, our energy industry, um, finished products that come back into Mexico after being in the United States. People forget that Mexico is our what is it? They're in the top three of our trading partners that we export to. I mean, it's China, Canada, Mexico. Um, so Mexico is a major export market for us. And if the Mexican government wants to, they can hurt American industry as well. Anybody else? You tired of listening to me? Drone on. Well, thank you so much for paying attention. I appreciate it. If you've got any follow-up questions or you want to talk about anything, I'll be here for a few minutes. So uh, it's nice to see you all. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everybody for coming. Tyler, thank you again. This is a good thing for our speakers. So thank, thank you so much. On your show. I certainly will. Thank you so much. So thanks everybody, and thanks everybody online in the webcast, and uh, we'll see you next time.